Good afternoon, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Christian Recorder Dialogues. My name is John Thomas III, the editor of the Christian Recorder. We are excited today to have a wonderful and enriching discussion with Mr. Rick Wade, who is the Vice President of the United States Chamber of Commerce, as well as a board member of our own HBCU, Wilberforce University, and Mr. Antoine C. Wright, whom you probably saw right before the President's address to Congress on Tuesday, well, Wednesday. So without further ado, gentlemen, I want y'all to have let us have this great and rich discussion about the economic states of America, how it's affecting us Black people, and what we're going to do after the pandemic. I can't wait to hear it. Thank y'all for being here. God bless you. We look forward to it. And you all will see me again at the end for some announcements. Thank you, Brother Seawright. Thank you, John Thomas III. And thank you for your friendship. And thank you for all you do uh, for the Christian Recorder. I firmly believe the Christian Recorder is better uh, because you serve as the editor. And I want to thank you. Uh, to all of you who joined us on a Friday at 1240 uh, Eastern Time, I'm, I'm just so thrilled that you'll be here. As always, please comment in the comment section with your district, your church. If you want to, you can tell me who your pastor and who your bishop may be. Uh, as always, shout out to my home bishop, Bishop Samuel Green and Supervisor Green from the 7th Episcopal District. And I could not uh, leave this moment without uh, always uh, honoring and recognizing my uncle, the 133rd Bishop of Amy Church, Bishop Ariel C. Wright and Supervisor C. Wright. Uh, I thank them for all they're doing and to so many friends in Amy Church and to all of you who are viewing around the world, thank you so much. Today, I am so privileged to have a hometown boy, but more importantly, a friend, a young man from Lancaster, South Carolina. The Yankers would say Lancaster, but in South Carolina, we say Lancaster. Um, Rick Wade is certainly no stranger to the AME Church and certainly no stranger to good trouble. Uh, graduated from the University of South Carolina worked on the House Ways and Means Committee in the South Carolina General Assembly, also worked, uh, played a very senior role at the University of South Carolina, went on to run a subsidiary of um, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Palmetto GPA. Uh, he served uh, as a cabinet director under Governor Hodges here in South Carolina, who was the last Democratic governor of the state, uh, did a number of things in between that, uh, went on to serve in senior roles uh, next to and with President Obama, including being Chief of Staff uh, to the Secretary of Commerce. And then uh, he left the Obama administration and got creative and went to do so many things. And here, Rick Wade sits with us as the Senior uh, VP at the United States Chamber of Commerce, and I think the highest ranking African American member of the staff over there. And we are just so proud of what Rick has done. And Rick, we thank you so much for taking time out of your extra busy schedule to be with the Amy Church. Well, Antoine, listen, man, thank you. You know, you and I are brothers and friends and and I couldn't think of a better place to be uh, on this Friday. So thank you for having me. Rick, you know, I flirted with your story and in and, and the church we say testimony. We don't always say story, but you have such a powerful story uh, to show and to tell. And you've done a lot of showing by your body of work you put together over your career. But tell us uh, a little bit about how you got to where you are uh, in the form of a Sunday school version. Because if you told us the revival version, we'll be here till next year this time. <laughs> well, listen, I mean, the Sunday school version is that's exactly where it started. I mean, I, I grew up in a time in Lancaster, South Carolina. Uh, where, you know, South Carolina was late to embrace uh, sec uh, integration. So I grew up in a very segregated, legal, legal segregated Lancaster, and I didn't go to middle school, uh, uh, integrated school until middle school. And I finally remember you know, having to go in the balcony to watch a movie and, and, and the colored only signs in the doctor's office. There was the colored side and the white side. And I say that because the one uh, foundational value uh, in, in my family uh, of eight, uh, first generation I was to go to college, uh, was faith. You know, I grew up in eight, in Mount Moriah and Design Church, and I'm still uh, hold a membership there because it's where I got my foundation. And you, know, you you talked about Sunday school. You know, back then we hadn't even, we didn't have any choice but to go to Sunday school. And I remember Mama making us sing in the in the boys choir, and I couldn't sing a lick, but that, it taught me something. And so I, I, I tell everybody uh, all around the world, uh, when they ask to hear my story, my story started out in the church with my relationship with Christ. 
And I've never forgotten that. It is, it is part of my DNA and who I am. And I look forward, as you will hear me through this conversation today, uh, weave that into everything that, that I do, uh, my purpose, my values, uh, all rooted in my faith. And, and later from the AME Zion Church, I probably visit more uh, AME churches uh, in South Carolina than than most have. Even when I ran for secretary of state, I just have to say this in 2002, I'll never forget when uh, Bishop Henry Beeland, I uh, go into the AME conference and he invited me up and I and I, I, I actually went to ITC seminary for a while and uh, and he, he gave me the microphone and I'll never forget that moment. And th the only reason I say that is because it's the church. It's been the AME church that's been interwoven into the social fabric, the political fabric, the progress, the success of South Carolina and this country. And I'm very grateful for this opportunity to share with you. Rick, uh, talk about, you know, I, I touched on this in my intro to you, but you have your fingerprints uh, on history uh, and your, I would say your footprints as well, uh, and your work with President Obama. Uh, we all can uh, feel um, the emotions from having a black president, but you had a chance to help him get elected, including when that uh, critical South Carolina primary back in 2008, where I was working against you. Uh, but you also had a chance to serve with him uh, and be around him and interact with him and help usher, marshal him uh, through a unique time in history. Frame up for us with some background color, what that was like in your experience. Well, it, I mean, it clearly one of, was, was one of the most amazing uh, moments of my entire life and my career and a major turning point. Uh, when I first met Barack back in 2007, uh, I was vice president of Blue Cross Blue Shield at the time. And uh, he called me and we ultimately met in his office in Washington, D.C. And, and one of the things that struck me uh, and I by the end, I had talked to Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton. And there were a ton of candidates, if you recall, who were running for the Democratic nomination. But but having run for office myself and understanding what it takes and being a black man in America and the challenge around office, I had it was an obligation, a commitment to support this brother. And, and I say Barack in a very endearing way because we knew each other and we still know each other by that term, not being disrespectful and not referencing him as president. But but we hit it off and I'll never forget in that conversation, uh, he, he talked about his vision for hope and change in America. But one thing that I'll never forget, he said, when I become president, here's what's gonna happen. Now, he didn't say if, he said when. And that led us into a deeper friendship and relationship that later became, you know, uh, understanding even his faith and what that meant. And, 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 and one of the first things I did when I introduced him to South Carolina was to introduce him to the communities of faith here in South Carolina. And, you know, even to this day, I think Michelle uh, stays in touch with Pastor Jackson at, at, at Brooklyn and his wife. And, and but that that all began in South Carolina. Uh, uh, if you remember, he had won the, the state of Iowa, which is a really big validator uh, that white America would support a black candidate in my mind. But it was South Carolina was the turning point uh, for his campaign. It, it, it is where he won his presidency because of the good people and the black people in South Carolina who voted overwhelmingly uh, in that primary to catapult him uh, into Super Tuesday and then the rest is history. And Rick, you also served in his administration uh, in a very, I would describe it at that time, a very consequential agency considering what the country was facing, one of the greatest recessions we had seen um, to that day. Talk about your work at the U.S. Department of Commerce. Yeah, and you know what, well, that's really interesting because like everybody, you know, you dream of this opportunity to work in the West Wing in the White House. And, but he asked me, uh, and, and during the transition, if I would go serve at the U.S. Department of Commerce, we did not have a Commerce Secretary on the day of inauguration. So I sort of kind of served in what you may call the interim role for several months. But it was one of the biggest blessings in my entire career because it was from that experience. And if you remember, we were dealing with the downturn economy from previous administration, but it, it exposed me to the world. Uh, I was at the, the, the Department of Commerce, and, and I'm sure everybody knows that this is the agency that deals with business and industry and economy. It's sort of a holding agency, a holding company, because there are like 11 or 13 agencies underneath the Department of Commerce, the Census Bureau, 
the Minority Business Development Agency, which is the only agency of its kind whose only job is to focus on strengthening minority businesses. There's NOAA, which is called the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, anything dealing with hurricanes, uh, and the International Trade Administration that deals with anything global. So it was an amazing experience for me to learn, to grow, and contribute. But the one thing that it shaped me was having a global perspective. I think I was there in about four or five weeks on the job, and they told me I had to lead a trade mission to India. And I led a whole business delegate, delegation. Quite frankly, up to that, man, I've really never been much much beyond the Bahamas. <laughs> and now that to lead a trade mission to India, to New Delhi and Chennai and Mumbai, and ultimately all over the world, leading business missions and interacting with leaders in China and Japan and across the continent of Africa, it gave me a global perspective. And one of the things I learned from there, which I use in all of my sermons and speeches, that is, is that 95% of the world's consumers are outside of our borders. So that whole, that whole riddle about why the bank rob or rob the bank is where the money is, right? So as we think of black businesses, which I think we'll talk about in a moment, one of my goals has been to get black businesses exposed in selling their products and services to the 95% of the world's consumers. They're not in the United States, they're around the world. So it was an amazing experience and to be a part of uh, the, the, the first Obama administration serving in that role and helping uh, President Obama at the time with the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Uh, I was on the task force of HBCUs and on Puerto Rico task force, just a number of fronts leading from the perspective of business and industry. And Rick, that has been your parachute or part of your parachute to land you in the role you are in now at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, give us put some background color to your role at the chamber, what it means, what you do, uh, and what it could mean um, for us. Yeah, well, you know, when I left the Department of Commerce, I started my own company, my own firm, uh, doing global uh, 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 business uh, partnerships and deals, etc. And I did end up at the cha at the Chamber of Commerce. I've been there now four years. I'm the only African American, uh, and certainly at the executive level on the senior executive team in the world's largest business organization. Remember the U.S. Chamber is not government. We represent 3 million companies around the world. So whether it's the big industry companies, uh, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Walmarts, or small black owned businesses. And so it's an extraordinary opportunity uh, to drive an agenda that is more inclusive. Uh, after the murder of George Floyd last year, uh, one of the things that I inspired and in now leading is what we call the Equality of Opportunity Initiative. It's about addressing the inequality, the race-based gaps that exist in America in education and criminal justice, unemployment, entrepreneurship, health and wealth. And it's all private sector led. And, and so we're advancing policies on Capitol Hill and in state legislators, late state legislatures to address the racial inequality in America. And then we're also working with companies across America because there are things that companies can do to address inequality and diversity, if you will, independent of policy. You know, one example that I'm most proud of, we just launched this year, uh, what we call the Corporate Board Accelerator Initiative, where we're committing to identifying, preparing, and connecting 250 Black executives on corporate boards. Our partnerships with historically Black colleges and universities called the Next Gen Business Partnership is focusing on developing the next generation of black business leaders and black business owners. So there's a lot of projects and initiatives that I'm leading uh, through the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, again, with the wind and the backing of companies across America. Uh, Rick, uh, I, I guess lay out for us uh, black and brown businesses, where we sit and where we stand today. This pandemic, as you know, has had disproportionate impact not only from a health perspective, but also from an economic perspective. In fact, I'd say it's the worst uh, health uh, crisis since 1913, some of the worst economic challenges since 1918. No, you're absolutely right. I did a piece on for CNN, and I think the title was Black Businesses Are in Ruin. The reality is that there are some 8 million minority Black, Brown uh, businesses in America and Asian. Uh, there are 2.6 million Black businesses. Uh, in America. Uh, some of, most of them are small. They're sole proprietors. One employee, two or three, they're small. But here's what's happened. There's some research that we did at the chamber that showed that 66% of all minority businesses in America were concerned about permanently closing as a result of the pandemic. 
One body of research showed that 41% of all black businesses have already closed. Now, th th that, that's unacceptable because these are not just businesses. Yes, they are creating wealth and creating jobs, but these are very important anchors in our communities. I mean, I, I tell a story growing up in Lancaster, we had an area called The Hill. The Hill was that black business district. It was our version of Black Wall Street over in Tulsa or Sweet Auburn down in Atlanta. And these business leaders, these business owners were our role models. And so I can't imagine uh, what this country, what our communities would look like and be like. Our social organizational structure would be decimated if we sit back and, and allow 41% of these businesses to close. So we're leading. I'm leading a lot of work. We didn't have the coalition to bag black businesses. It was seeded by a $10 million of, of a grant, if you will, a check from American Express. Now, other companies are on board uh, working with all of the black chambers of commerce and, and other organizations. And the goal there was immediately to get money uh, in the pockets of these black business owners, small grants to keep the doors open. And now we're expanding that, expanding that uh, and to, to do even more, a, a, a greater investment uh, in trying to get them the capital they need, not just to stay, keep the doors open, but to sustain themselves and to grow. And then the final piece to that, that uh, we're working very diligently on is getting these black businesses connected to corporate supply chains because all of these companies buy products and goods and services, and they need to be intentional about doing business with black companies. Uh, Rick, my grandma used to say, uh, son, from where you sit determines what you see. Uh, from where you sit, what do you see as challenges going forward from a business perspective, in particular uh, relating to communities that look like ours? Well, your, your grandma was absolutely right. And, uh, and, and where I sit, I do see the world, I see, see business. And, and there are two or three major challenges. One, access to capital, 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 capital. Uh, I mean, whether you're a business, whether you're an organization, whether you're a church, uh, you got to have resources to run. And in the case of business, it's about making additional money and resources that you can invest back in your people by jo creating jobs and black back in the community. But it's also the number one barrier for black businesses in America. So we're working hard to try to solve that. I mean, it's unconscionable when you think that only 2%, maybe three, depending on what data you look at, of all the venture capital goes to black founders who are trying to start companies in tech and in other industries. That's unconscionable. I mean, and, and, and let's not forget that the lending practices from financial institutions and big banks, they're rooted in race. I mean, let's not forget about redlining back in the day where, you know, you couldn't get home mortgages. And a lot of those practices have been extended into lending today. So we got to break down those barriers. But I think it's capital uh, is a number one challenge that faces us again, whether in business or whether uh, we're workers. I mean, it, it is all about as Barack told me last time we got together, we got to figure out how to get this paper. And we mean, and he meant that in all sincerity, because that's where we lack. And we got to have access to capital and resources if we're going to sustain ourselves in the future. The other thing, which is, again, I, I mean, I don't have to say to this audience, is the whole issue of inequality. I mean, we can't deny that there's still racial inequality in America. And, and I think that is a number one as well, if there is a, another one or a big one, issue that we have to lean in as a country and seek to solve. We have a partnership with the Kellogg Foundation that says if they did a big body of research called the business case for racial equity. Antoine, here's what they said that worked, that if we close the inequality gaps in America, the racial inequality gap, our GDP grows by eight trillion dollars. Oh, my now, God. That's a big deal. And that's what's leading the work and informing the work that I'm doing. We know that addressing racism and racial inequality is a moral imperative. Those are matters of our heart and our faith. But there's a business case, too. And that's the case that I'm taking across America, the business and industry and policymakers. And what's interesting is working. And so we're continuing this work. And uh, again, I think that, that the church plays such an incredible part of all of the work that we're doing. Rick, one of the things you and I have talked about personally uh, has been access to capital. Uh, we know that's a tremendous uh, landmine or stumbling block uh, for a lot of black and brown businesses. What can you say to the AME Church watchers from around the world and others who are tuning in today about what we need to do to make sure access to capital is not a barrier to entry for people who look like us? 
Well, you know, one of the things that we can do, and in fact, I just had a similar conversation at New Birth down in Atlanta with uh, a, a doctor, Pastor Jamal Bryant, about this issue. And if you think of the church as a, a broader ecosystem, let's start there. You have business owners, you have entrepreneurs. And I, I would love to see the AME Church in particular, and I love to work with AME Church to identify who those entrepreneurs are. Because at the end of the day, capital oftentimes is about relationships. And we learned that when we had the, the PPP funding, that a lot of black businesses did not get access to that money. And there were a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons that we learned is that black business didn't have the extensive relationships with banks and other institutions. So we got to close that gap. And there's one in which we can all work together on. Uh, I do think it's something to, uh, to, to say that uh, if the church broadly uh, could pool and, and collectively uh, uh, leverage its own funds. Uh, if you think about it, uh, you know, these banks respond. Well, we can move money if we move our capital. We are a 1.1 trillion consumer society as Black America. That's what we spend every year. And if we could move and, and be, be strategic in where we put our funds, our money, and leverage that movement to get capital flow into our communities, I promise you, you see different results. And I, I, I just fundamentally believe, again, that the church as a guide, as people of faith, that that's the kind of leadership that can get people moving in the right direction. So uh, I, I would be excited to work with, with the AME Church in any of these fronts in solving this access to capital challenge. But we're going to do our best to make sure uh, we, we set it up. But, but outside of that, what else, can, what else role can the church play in terms of uh, getting us towards a more perfect union, especially in the areas we're talking about here today, commerce and business, because I think it's so important. Sometimes the church's power in our minds is framed to just showing up to vote on an election cycle, but that's only a raindrop on Lake Murray <laughs> uh, part of the equation. Talk about what you think the church's role could be in help framing and shaping what our communities look like. Well, well, you're right. I mean, you know, I've, I've always espoused that, you know, voting is just the beginning of the longer process of, of creating change in America. We got to get more into accountability and the policy work. Mm -hmm. How do we hold our elected officials accountable once we elect them? And again, I mean, I think as the church leadership meets with elected officials, you know, we got to be clear about what our agenda is. And on that agenda needs to be capital. It needs to be how do we, how, what are you going to do, Mr. Elected Official, Mr. Candidate, to, you know, once you sold to the polls and money in the bank, that don't work for me. I mean, so we got to figure out and ask these hard questions of our elected officials before they get elected on their agenda to advance capital, to invest in our communities, to hold corporations accountable through policies and other measures, to locate companies in our communities. And so, you know, it, it's an economic agenda. And, you know, it, 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 people have this sort of interesting theory is, is a civil rights or economic. It's both. They go hand in glove. You can't have one without the other. That's like you can't have social justice with economic without economic opportunity. And so, again, I think these issues being front and center on the on the agenda of the church broadly, uh, because the church still is that is, is, is that fundamental institution. Uh, that's always been where we engage politically, where we organize historically. And it's as relevant today as it was then. But these are the key issues, I believe, that has to be on the agenda as we're engaging in the political process. Rick, let's talk about workforce for a minute, because the days of going to college, getting a sports management degree, I'm not knocking anybody with those kind of degrees, but those days uh, may not be as beneficial as they were before, because a degree don't necessarily mean uh, success uh, in terms of financial success. The workforce has changed a lot. You have been able to stick your toes in waters all across the world. What does the workforce look like going forward uh, in this country and around the globe? Because it doesn't look like what it looked like for our parents and grandparents. Well, one thing for sure, if you look at the data, it's going to look like us. It's going to be people of color, brown and black people across America. And you, you know the data by 2030, 2040, 2050 and beyond, uh, America would be majority uh, black and brown. And here's why this matters, because companies and, 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 and the investments we make today to address the skills gap, for example, among black and brown people 
will determine our ability to compete as a country and to be compete as, as, as companies and to thrive and survive and, and have the workers who are going to need to fill the jobs. Uh, but when you look at the data, Antoine, and you look at, for example, the, the, the math skills gap, and we mm -hmm. often talk, talk about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Well, our black kids are not re doing math at the same level as their white peers, even in reading. So, but, but we got to make investments right now to close those gaps because these will be the only the frontline workers, but these will be the C-suite executives and the board directors of the future companies and industry. So this is one that I'm pushing very, very hard. And then you couple that with the fact that automation is changing the workforce. That's right. And and so, you know, jobs that were one do, once done manually, even when I was growing up, those jobs were gone from the, in the manufacturing sector many years ago. Now we have the technological revolution where automation, it, robots, all of these other techno technological solutions are replacing people. And there's a lot of research. McKinsey has done research on the impact of automation on black people in America, particularly in the South. And so we have to be very intentional uh, of driving again an agenda that's seeking to close these gaps today because these will be the workers of the future. Communities of color, people who are black and people who are brown. Rick, I'm gonna give you two more questions. Uh, first and foremost, um, I said this to a group of uh, students uh, on Monday and I'll ask you, what does it mean to compete in an ever-changing global society? When we were, when I was coming along, I was competing with, from Swansea, I was competing with students at Spring Valley, Ritz of Northeast, maybe somebody in Lancaster, maybe somebody in Orangeburg. But now, while we sit here on this, uh, on this dialogue, Rick, there are students in China, Russia, uh, Africa, who are getting twice the education that some of our kids are getting here in the United States. So what does it mean to compete in an ever-changing global society? Well, I think part of your question is the answer, that it is ever-changing. And the reality, as you so eloquently stated, is that we're not just competing with kids at Harvard and Morehouse and Spelman and Wilberforce, on which board I serve, but you're competing with kids in China and Bangalore and South Africa and around the world. And, and as I talked about earlier, we got to understand that even the business, 95% of the world's consumers are outside the United States. So the world, the world is the oyster. But the opportunity, though, to understand and learn and engage the world is, is, is more obvious and acceptable and accessible today than I've ever seen in my life. And if, if there any reason is because of this thing we now call the Internet and the access to information. And I challenge young people and old people like me that take this time, even during this pandemic, to learn the world. You can go online, you can go, you can go across the world virtually uh, and learn and experience not only uh, the cultures, but uh, again, leverage this knowledge to create new economic opportunity. So it's changing and not to mention the geopolitical issues across the world. I mean, how we engage China and Russia and all of these other issues. We need to understand these issues. And I think oftentimes leaders think, well, these are not issues that they don't talk about these issues when they come to get our votes on, on Sunday morning at the church. And we need to make sure that these issues that they're, they're helping us understand what it means uh, in this global uh, uh, ever changing world, uh, how that affects jobs, uh, how we think about what's called foreign investment. All of this foreign investment that comes in the United States, but it doesn't come to our communities. These are global issues. So I think as the world changes so much we, and the way we change is to become knowledgeable and understanding of these issues. And again, making these issues relevant to our people and our communities. Finally, Rick, what's next for Rick Wade? Uh, your name has been floated to do many things, whether it's going to an administration, whether it's perhaps be a college president. Uh, uh, your name has been mentioned to run for office. Your name has been mentioned to do a lot of things, Mr. Rick Wade, young man from Lancaster. What's next for you, my man? <laughs> you know what? And when I hear my name being floated, I run the other way. You know, <laughs> you, know Andrew, you know me well enough, man. I I, I, I am, and I, I end this by saying uh, how I started. I mean, I'm, I'm, I am literally I'm so committed to doing God's work. And I'm not saying that just because we're here in the, in, with the AME Church. But that's my guide. And so I will go forth and go where I'm sent. But for this time, such a time as this, I'm where I'm supposed to be. 
and, and I'm delighted uh, uh, to have participated in this forum with you. And I want to say one last thing before we end. I was doing an interview the other day with uh, a reporter, and he was asking me what was the most challenging thing in my life. And I, I'm saying this because it's related to the AME Church. And I tell the story often. The most difficult time in my life was not growing up in Lancaster. It wasn't losing my parents. It was the murder at Mother Emanuel. Hmm. You and I both knew uh, Reverend Clemente Pinkney, our friend. But it took me to a place that I'd never been before. And I'm not going to recap that, but 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 when 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 that kind of tragedy happened, it inspired me in a way that I've never been inspired before. And to recognize how much more work has to be done. And 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 and, and that that's that's where I am. I am I, I've committed my life not just to talk to talk but walk to walk. But that moment in time, and I remember when the White House called me and asked me, how should we be responding? What should we be? President Obama has to go there. He has to go there. And, and he obviously did. And, 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 and that song, Amazing Grace, is what drives me, what sustains me, because I know the grace that I get, but I also know the obligation that I have. Mm -hmm. And so I want to thank you for this opportunity to share with you this afternoon. And I, I look forward uh, to, to, to our friendship, our brotherhood. Uh, uh, in, in the days and months and years to come. Well, Rick, I, we, we're certainly uh, here at the Christian Recorder going to do everything we can to make sure this message is spread at both, both wide and deep, but also figure out some creative ways for you to engage with the general church uh, and the collective church um, through as many forms and opportunities as we can because people need to know and understand what's out there. And there was a day in which we were on the menu and not at the table. Now we got Rick Waves at the table determining what the menu looks like. And so it's time for us to eat. Uh, yeah. And so, Rick, we appreciate your friendship to the Amy Church. I personally appreciate you uh, at, at any given time putting your arms around me uh, and embracing me and helping me get a little further down the road because that's rare, uh, unfortunately, in the circles that we find ourselves in. So. Uh, thank you, and we'll see you soon. John Thomas, uh, I know you're around somewhere and uh, want to toss this uh, football back to you, my man. I will certainly, Mr. Wade and Ashbon, thank you again for this rich and wonderful discussion. Um, we often talk about, you know, structural racism and the fact that one of the ways we have to get the structure right is we have to deal with the economic aspects of that structural racism. You have enlightened us, you've inspired us, and you definitely will be hearing from us again. I guarantee and promise you that in the months and years to come. So, yes, sir. So thank you again for being with us. And thank you, Antoine, for having this discussion. Thank and you. we know you're coming back soon in a little bit as well. And we're going to talk about that at a sec. So we're going to do our announcements. Feel free to stay on in the green room if you like, but we have the following announcements coming up and over the next few weeks. So our next dialogue, speaking of um, Antoine Seawright, will be with Bishop Vashti McKenzie on May 6th. We will be interviewing Bishop McKenzie as part of our celebration of retiring Bishop to General Officers. You don't want to mix this important dialogue with Bishop McKenzie as we discuss her career, what she's done for the church, what she's done with her ministry, and what's next. And Antoine C. Robert will be our host. Also, as you know, on Sunday, we held a special screening of the Spirit of African Methodism. Our next screening of the Anvil will be on May 16th at 5 p.m. Eastern when we will share with you um, echoes from the General Conference. I'm sorry, put the, there's a, the, the, the tech team, put that, not that one tech team. There's one more flyer there that should be in there. Um, we have a lot of anvils in there. Um, well, they'll, they'll, well, the next Anvil screening will be on May 16th at 5 p.m. Eastern time. We will be sending out an email about how you can participate in this. Reminder that we are sharing these screenings in order to raise awareness as well as funds to help us produce the final documentary in the series, AME Next. It's not the final word on the AME Church, but it's the final documentary in this free documentary series, of which we hope there will be many more. But remember, we have created AME Next. We need an amount of money to help finish it. 
Bishop McKenzie, the executive producer, and Dr. Mark Tyler have shared that. They shared that on Sunday, and they'll be again on May 16th to talk about that. We ask that you support the Christian Recorder by buying subscriptions for $36 a year. Visit our website at thechristianrecorder.com for more information. And also visit our YouTube page to look at the other dialogues we've done. It's important that we have your support to keep doing this wonderful, enriching work that we're trying to do to share and educate the church. Next, support the AME Publishing House for your church, school, and worship needs. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, the AME Publishing House building will be finished in September, and we've been giving you updates here as well as on YouTube, and there are some special resources that are coming out from Publishing House in May that you don't want to miss, some good video resources for your congregation. Check them out. Visit the web store, the website, and also go to imame.org. Our sponsors for today's broadcast are, we have with us Ida Tyree Hill, Ida Tyree Heights Hill for Judicial Council. And we also have John Foster for Bishop. We thank you our, to our sponsors for allowing us to continue to do these dialogues and to continue to be able to share these things with you. Again, you don't want to miss our next dialogue on May 6th with Bishop McKenzie. It will be an important dialogue, which we will share about her ministry. We encourage you, if you haven't already, to go back and look at the screening of the Anvil that we have on our YouTube channel and join us on May 16th for that next screening. And also one other thing, and I know I'm going long in the announcements, but we and May 31st, we'll be celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa massacre, the Tulsa Black Wall Street massacre. And the AME Church is at the heart of that. We will be sharing information about the History Channel documentary that is coming up, as well as interviewing the pastor of Vernon AME Church later on in May. You don't want to miss that because as painful a part of our story it is, it shows us what we've been able to do in the past with our economic empowerment, what we can do in the future. We have our closing PSA today, courtesy of Values Partnerships regarding COVID vaccines. I've gotten my two doses. Please get your doses because that's the only way that we can beat this pandemic. Tech team, please share our PSA and we'll see you again next It was made to say game nights and marquee lights. Tuesday Night Live, Good Vibes, and The Sunday Drive. It was made to save family meals, turkey naps, and taffeta. It was made to save nine to fives, and just being able to provide. It was made to save the lifesavers. It was made by the best among us, to be effective. The COVID-19 vaccines were made to save. They were made to save us. Thank you. We'll see you next time.